All right, let's talk about systemic racism, or at least the idea of systemic racism. Yeah. So I think you've seen the video uh, of me about two or two and a half years ago with Larry Elder, and I brought up systemic racism. Larry Elder proceeded to commit a hate crime on me, a white man. He beat me senseless with statistics. Yeah. And I came to a, a fight, not ready to, to fight, basically. Mm -hmm. And that was definitely one of my red pill moments, mm -hmm. so to speak. I was not prepared. I heard new information. I did research after that. Subsequently, I've had many people on this show and many conversations uh, that have led me to, to more of Larry's original premise. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess first, when you, when you saw that moment, uh, was that the first time you had ever seen me do anything? Because that's what a lot uh, of people tell me, and I'm like, oh. I don't think it was the first time, but I yeah. think, I mean, I don't en envy anyone who's debating Larry Elder on anything. He's, yeah. he's pretty devastating. It but, must have um, been kind of refreshing, though, when you saw this moment where he laid it out, and yeah. you know, there was no counter, because right. there is no counter. Right. Well, yeah, he, he, what he did with you there is he, he went through each specific venue in which supposedly there is this big systemic racism problem where the system is rigged in such a way that it doesn't require any individual in the system to be racist in order for the system to spit out racist outcomes. Mm -hmm. That's essentially the idea of systemic racism. So he went, he went with you through, he said, just name, name a place in society where you think systemic racism exists, and he just... De ba basically destroyed each one with the specifics of, of the case, and uh, I'm I'm not going to do a better job <laughs> than he did there or yeah. than he's capable of doing. But there there is a bigger picture way to test the systemic racism hypothesis, which is to take two populations where it's it's a very messy, crude science experiment, but to take two populations where you're holding systemic racism constant namely black Americans like myself and black immigrants, especially black immigrants from the West Indies and their children. So we're talking about immigrants from Jamaica, Barbados, other places in the West Indies, and specifically their children, their American-born children. So these are people you could not tell apart from black, like you couldn't tell if I didn't tell you that I wasn't the child of a Jamaican immigrant or mm -hmm. something, right? And you find the, the the thing about these is that these two populations differ in many ways. Some 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 ways are very hard to quantify, but they differ culturally. They differ for all kinds of reasons, um, because partially because the kind of immigrant who gets out of a Jamaica differs systematically. Is going to be disproportionately intelligent, disproportionately hardworking. Whatever the traits are that get you from Jamaica to New York, say, that's a cluster of attributes that that makes that population differ. But there's, there's one thing that is not different, which is they are subjected to whatever level of systemic racism exists. So T Thomas Sowell has done good work on, he, he, back in the 70s, he, he showed that uh, second generation West, Indi West Indians living in the same city as black Americans were earning 58% more. Right, so they're they're both being treated to whatever degree badly by white people. They're whatever this whatever system you want to suppose is holding black people back is equally affecting both of them. Uh, the, the Columbia so sociologist Van Tran has a great essay in which uh, um, you know, the, this this difference is, is brought out. You find neighborhoods of of black Americans right next to neighborhoods of black West Indians in New York. They're equally segregated from white people, mm -hmm. so it gets rid of you know this, the the idea that being segregated by itself or living around people who only look like you is inherently a um, a, a disadvantage. Um, it gets around the the policing issue because these populations are being police. The police can't tell the difference between a second generation West Indian and and a black person. It gets around whatever level of systemic racism is or isn't in, in the pipeline with regard to schools. And you find wildly different outcomes. You find you know, rate of high school graduation much higher for black West Indians, uh, rate of enrollment in college much higher, rate of you know, professional occupations much higher, crime lower, right? So this suggests to me that there mm -hmm. are that, that the role of systemic racism to to whatever degree it exists is is minimal 
at this point. Uh, and the, 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 there's a whole narrative built around the idea that this is the primary obstacle facing black people. And it's worth noting, I don't, I don't think most black people actually believe this. Hmm. Because, I mean, there, there are various polls to cite here, but there's, there's one from Pew that, that asked black people without, high, without college educations, has, has, race, has your race held you back at all in life? 60% said no. It's a recent Pew poll. Hmm. Another Gallup poll asked, is bias the main issue facing you in, in, in jobs and housing? 60% again said no. The, uh, the, the Harvard sociologist Ethan Foss has done extensive polling of the black community and found that disconnected black youth, which are you know, black youth without, who aren't in schools and don't have a job, so the people on the lowest rung of society, something, something around 30% of them think the system is rigged and 70% don't. So what, what we're getting is we're getting the voices of black people who believe the systemic racism narrative promoted to the to the most powerful uh, media positions in our country, so we're getting the impression that right. this is a uniform view, and it's not. Right. So this is sort of the Jesse Jacksons, Al Sharptons. Yeah. They get moved up because they're given sort of simple answers. Right. So I guess it it harkens the question. Then I could ask this either way. <laughs> what is it that the West Indian immigrants are doing right, mm -hmm. or what is it that the other folks are doing wrong? Yeah. You, I mean. You can answer that in either direction you want sure. to go first. Well, par I mean, part of it is just immigration selection factors that I mentioned, right? So the, the kind of Jamaican or Barbadian who makes it off the island to New York is di likely to be disproportionately hardworking, dispropor disproportionately X for whatever X factor is. And so in, in that sense, the, the direct uh, comparison can be misleading, but it just analyzing why these two populations differ. You find West Indian immigrants uh, more likely to come from a two-parent home, um, you know, more likely to have, have had a m more classically socially conservative upbringing, which is you, know, you don't talk back to your parents. Parents are rather strict. There are downsides, of course, to that style of parenting. But um, it, basically, what I'm saying is that there are cultural factors that are important that differ between these two groups, right? You find if, if there are there are many. I mean, th this is this is where the conversation for many people gets especially uncomfortable, yeah. right? It's the idea that every culture, every subculture, is identical in the beha behavioral patterns that are inculcated, and wherever there is some wh wherever there is a disparity in some outcome, it's not possible that culture accounts for some or most of of that disparity, which I think is a very silly idea. Well, it's um, completely nonsensical. Yeah, uh, yes. Cultures are different. Different yeah. people and different groups put different emphasis on certain things. Some yeah. put more on family. Some put more on education. Some put more on sports or yeah. whatever the hell, whatever right. the hell it is. So when you hear Larry Elder make the argument, you know, something around until 1972, the black family had a higher rate of, of staying in marriages, and then he mm -hmm. lays out the reasons that he believes policies of the Democrats destroyed all that. Mm -hmm. That, that obviously resonates with you, right? Because you're, you're giving me some piece of this. Both answers, I think, resonate or went back to family, rates yeah. of marriage and, and some sort of conservative ideals. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's a very complex question. people hate when you talk, when yes. anyone talks about this, yes. about family. People yes. just absolutely hate it. It is, it is a fact that black, the, the rate of two-parent homes and marriages was pretty similar to the white rate until the 60s. Um, it is. It is a. It's a matter of scholarly dispute as to what was the cause. It, it, I think it's certain at this point there was no one cause. Welfare state may have had something to do with it, but I think it, it may have just been changing norms in the culture, because we're seeing the same thing happen in in, in the white working class as well now, mm -hmm. with uh, the decline of of two parent homes to a lesser extent than than has happened in the black community. Um, yeah. So so. I guess what, what, yeah. So I mean, we could talk about some of the Im the most important behavioral patterns that are different between uh, black families and, and white families and Asian families. Um, I mean, there there are some statistics that I, I I just I don't see any way in which this could possibly be explained by systemic racism. For example, one is that if you ask 13 year olds if they've had their first sexual experience yet, 
you get 9% of, of whites saying yes, you get 21% of black people saying yes, right? So it's more than a two-fold difference there. And that has everything to do with family dynamics, with, with there not being two parents in the home. It, it is a development issue more than it is an issue of treatment by white people, mm -hmm. right? I, I have another piece in Colette uh, called Black American Culture and, and the Racial Wealth Gap, where I talk about spending differences. And you, you, you know, Nielsen, the, the marketing firm, has done, done research on this, found that the average black woman is more likely to own a luxury vehicle than the average white woman, hmm. despite the fact that the average uh, black family has one-tenth the wealth of, of, of the average, average white family. Spending patterns on, on jewelry and, and expensive clothes are very different in the black community. Um, Whatever you want to say about these from an ethical, this is not, I mean, I'm not. Right, I know you're one, not making an ethical judgment. Right, I mean, I'm not finger wagging at people saying do X, don't do Y. I'm saying there are, there are entire books written by respected left wing scholars about issues like you know, wealth or income or that, that just don't mention a single one of these facts as if it's not relevant, right? So what's, what's the through line then, or the connection between all of this and the welfare state? Because the more that I've explored these ideas, the more that I am starting to buy that that almost is the, the real problem here. That we've given a certain amount and then it's just human nature. People don't want to stop being on the dole. That has nothing to do with race. You could give it to anyone. But in this case, we happen to be talking about black Americans. But I can give you just one simple example, which is my sister lives in, uh, in Manhattan, not that far from you actually, and she's in a building that's part subsidized. So there's a lot of black people in the building that have been there for generations now that are there subsidized. My sister and her husband, two kids, they're not rolling in dough, they're paying full market price. But the people that are in the subsidized housing, it's almost impossible for them to leave. I don't even blame them because they're paying next to nothing. And if they wanted to work more, they'd probably, and then get off the, subs the subsidies, mm -hmm they'd probably have to leave the building in the first place and right. go live somewhere worse. So we end up with this horrific catch-22 that again, I don't blame, I don't put this on race, it just seems to be affecting people of a certain race more. Yes, I think, I mean, I think it's clear that there was a point in, in, in the late 60s and 70s where the welfare state was clearly incentivizing counterproductive behavior disproportionately among black people. Um, I mean, the reason I, yeah, I, I, I don't, I think we need a welfare state. I think there's, there's really no free market, there's no capitalist economy in the world that doesn't have one because mm -hmm. they're just, and, and, you know, people's jobs are being taken by automation and that's only going in one direction. And we clearly need a welfare state and we need one that doesn't incentivize, uh, you know, Counterproductive behavior, and we haven't always had that. And yeah. it's when you say welfare state, you mean some sort of social safety net. That's basically. what I mean. Yes. Okay. Correct. Because I think people, when you say welfare state, I think people have a different sort of connotation. Perhaps. Yeah. I mean a social. I, I mean something that catches yeah. the people who can't really can't help themselves, who can't trade their skills for uh, money in the market. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. So, yeah. so then, how do we untether the issue? of people that are now stuck in that machine, where every time you talk about it, you're called a racist. No, I mean, this is, yeah, it, it is extremely pernicious because I, th I think it's clear that the welfare state, the way it was rolled out in the 60s and 70s, had bad effects for black people, right? It's, it's, it's hard to fully explain the decline in two-parent homes without noticing that a, you know, a black mother in the early 70s stood to lose money by getting married mm -hmm. to a guy, right? Because of the perverse incentives of the welfare state. That said, it's not, the, just because the welfare state was one of the causes of the decline of the black family doesn't imply that taking it away would repair it. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that is something, like Charles Murray, for example, wrote a big book in the 80s that made him big, Losing Ground which criticized the welfare state very much along these grounds. But I think even he has acknowledged that at this point, removing it, once you set it all into motion, mm -hmm. it's not obvious that removing it is a cure, which is, which is 
tragic, but true. Yeah, it's a, it's a real tragedy yeah. because then it's like, I mean, this is where and you would definitely have an, a, a difference of opinion with Candace, mm -hmm. where her okay. argument is rip the Band-Aid. Rip the Band-Aid, let the pieces fall where they may. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what her policy is on then helping like the poorest of the poor or uh -huh. whatever. Like, are you literally going to be kicking people out of their houses? Right. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Yeah. But I think there's, there's a growing feeling, I think, at least of, of a certain set of people that it's not working. You're acknowledging why it's not working, and these little band-aid fixes seemingly only make it worse. Yeah, it's. I think it's a very complex issue the because there, there are some there are some elements of the social safety net that I think economists agree are working, like the earned income tax credit, mm -hmm. which actually incentivizes you to work. It helps the worst off people in society without. It, it basically corrects the the massive mistake of welfare in the Lyndon Johnson era. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a complex issue, yeah. for sure. So I hate to talk about race this whole time. It's like kind of annoying. I know it's what you mostly write about. What, what else is kind of on your mind? Like, what are the other issues that you care about? I, I mean, we can keep going on that, but I always feel like it's like, it's, that's also a sort of tragedy of all of this. Yeah. It's like your whole worldview is to move past all this. Yes. And yet because of that, you get thrust in, into the conversation. It's right. a weird... Uh, a weird psychological condition, I suppose. Yes, it is. Does that uh, just drive you crazy in general? Yeah, I mean, I don't... Before I, we move on. <laughs> I, race is not something I find inherently interesting. Yeah. I think it is... Like, when I have, when I have a free moment to, to read a book, I'm not ordering the race book. <laughs> because... But, but at the same time, it, it is a topic that looms so large in our politics. And so much of what is said makes so little sense that... I, it, it, it just gets to me, so I have to say something, but it's not something I enjoy. I mean, what, what I really enjoy is uh, philosophy and science. Um, so, so when I have free moments, I, I tend to read things in those, in those genres. Yeah, well, you're working for the right lady, Claire, over yeah. at Quillette, because yeah. that, that's what she cares about, too. Mm -hmm. So actually, we can shift a little bit. So uh, you attended an event uh, that uh, there's an IDW group in New York put together. Mm -hmm. uh, it was put together in like two or three days. It was me and Eric Weinstein and Faisal Matar and, mm -hmm. and Melissa Chen. And we were just kind of doing like IDW 101 stuff. And you, you asked me an interesting question during the Q&A. So I'll let you present the question and then I want to hear your answer actually before I repeat my answer. Yeah. So my, my question was essentially, there are a lot of people who really don't like the intellectual dark web think it's just a bunch of cranks who are you know, playing footsie with the alt-right in this objectionable way um, and totally dismiss the whole thing. But then there, there, are, there are many other people who think, well, you know, I, I, like, I like half of the people in the, in the intellectual dark web. You know, I don't maybe like the other half, but I think it's, they have a you know, kind of nuanced take on it, but they're really, what, where one loses them is the fact that you know, you, you've had Stefan Molyneux, Mol, I don't know how to pronounce Molyneux. it. Molyneux. Molyneux, right. So this, this, <clears throat> this character that people view as objectionable to whatever degree, I, I don't know, I don't follow him, so I don't know whether they should or shouldn't view him that way. Yeah. But, you know, or Sam Harris has had Charles Murray on the podcast, which, you know, many, he, he just has a terrible reputation on the left, largely undeserved. Yeah, or Joe um, Rogan had Alex Jones on. I mean, exactly. we can we can do, you can a, do an endless ad infinitum. Yeah. Um, and it seems like that is is the last place where people who might otherwise see this phenomenon as good get off the ship. Yeah. Or I've I've had I think I've had conversations with people where that was kind of the last trench to die in in terms of criticizing the phenomenon. So my question was, what do you like? What do you think about this? Do you think? I mean, this is also a criticism that Barry Weiss raised in her in her piece about yeah. it. So I, I mean, I guess my answer to that would be, I'm. I mean, well, do you, do you know this guy Daryl Davis? He he he's a, a black guy who did a documentary. Can't oh, remember the name of it. Where he met with the white supremacists. He met right? with Ku, Ku Klux Klan members. Yeah. As a black person. Yeah. And just hung out with them talk to them about various issues, became friends with them, right? So imagine the psychological courage this takes to sit across from someone who literally thinks you are an inferior kind of human being and to put that aside and just expand your circle of empathy to include them preemptively. Incredibly inspirational. 
So, and he ends up getting over 200 Ku Klux Klan members to renounce their membership, and he keeps their robes in his closet as a kind of trophy of having de-radicalized mm -hmm. them, okay? And then he gets harshly criticized from Black, Black Lives Matter for having, having done this. Um, which is, which I, found, I find to be the most galling irony in the world because we're talking about a person who has done more to reduce racism in this society than almost anyone I could name in mm. Black Lives Matter, right? He has, he has gone, like uh, you know, many, many progressive activists, they, they tend to go to the spaces that are actually most progressive already mm -hmm. and try to make them even more progressive. So they show up on the university campuses, already the most progressive places on planet Earth, and then accuse them of being systemically racist, right? So we're talking about a guy who actually went into the trenches. Yeah, he went places, to the belly of the beast. No exactly, doubt about it. and was successful in de-radicalizing people from white racism. Um, the, the, point, the point I'm making here is not, not to compare, obviously, Charles Murray or Stefan to, to a Ku Klux Klan member. My point is we ought to be expanding the range of people we're willing to talk to and disagree with. And I think that insofar as you're able to challenge people or just expose, expo expose people's ideas, I think that in the long run, as uncomfortable as it is and counterintuitive as it is, tends to, tends to be better. Yeah, so I'll just repeat it quickly, but that, in essence, that last portion especially, really was my answer. Now, first off, some of us, Rogan, me, and Sam particularly, we interview people, mm -hmm. so we can't say we're for you know, plurality of ideas and we want to talk to people we disagree with and all that and then only talk to people we agree with. Mm -hmm. So that means we are going to talk to some of these characters. Without getting into any of the specifics of the people that I've had on the show, of course sometimes somebody, you may not ask the right question here or there. Right. I'm, not even, I'm not even saying that that's what I did or didn't do. But you ha like, otherwise we're not taking any risks mm -hmm. and the group of people that will talk to will become infinitely smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And also we'll be sort of, um, we'll be hostages to people that don't like us in the first place. And that's what I'm more concerned about. Mm. It's like, I don't want people who don't want any conversation to be happening at all to have ownership over who I'm gonna talk to. Yeah. Now, on any specific moment, could any of us do something a little bit differently? Sure, but in essence, yeah, you're asking about the gatekeeping that, yeah. that Barry was talking about. Yeah. I don't even know that it's it's for me to say. And as I said before, you know, we don't even have. It's not like we're walking around with laminated cards and we go to a secret meeting somewhere. Right. But I think the best sunlight's the best disinfectant. I just mm -hmm. I just fundamentally believe that. And as far as I know, no one was hurt by any of the interviews that I've done. And mm -hmm. I think I've I've helped a lot of people that were maybe into some of those yeah. ideas. You know, that was the right. one that people were giving me a lot of. That's the it's the Daryl Davis phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, nobody's um, lost. I mean, that's what I really believe. And maybe that's a little um, rose-colored glasses of me. But I believe that, you know, when, when people were giving me crap for doing Alex Jones, it's like, forget what he thinks about things for a moment. Clearly hundreds of thousands or millions of people are watching this. Yeah. I came on on a live show, I said whatever I believe. I didn't lie about anything. I said the same things I say here. And then I got emails from his people saying, you know, I never heard a decent liberal talk before. Now I watch your interview with Brett Weinstein. It's like, yeah. wow, that's pretty cool, man. So I just think perhaps we, and I mean you and I in this case, we just have a little bit more tolerance for, I don't think if someone hears something, it's gonna immediately infect them and then mm. they're gonna take that infection and infect other people. But yeah. I think a lot of people operate in that prison. I think so. I mean, the, the, uh, one of the reasons I asked this question at the event is because... I was glad you did, by the way. Yeah. yeah. It's because, for example, Charles Murray has retweeted some of my pieces. And you know, I've, I've gotten into exchanges with some of my critics where I've, I've kind of talked them down off of the ledge of me being a sellout right. or you know, convinced them that I'm, I'm operating in good faith. And the trench they're dying in criticizing me is, well, Charles Murray retweeted you, and he is X, Y, and Z. Therefore, I, I, I think, A, that's just, that's like two layers of ad hominem. Yeah. Like ad hominem is attacking you instead of your belief, but attacking someone else instead of your belief, yeah. it's like. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit much. Yeah, yeah, it's ad hominem twice over. 
But we seem but, to be in this in this place now where people like lists. You know, the SPLC is making lists of people that are bad people. Yeah. You know, there was this alternative influencer graph that you yes, probably saw that I tried did, to yeah. link together. I didn't even know probably ten or fifteen of the people on there, and I don't. I, you know, and I looked at the list after where they're including me in this like crazy whatever it was white supremacist list or something. Yeah. Not only did I not know plenty of the people. Several of them I have muted because they hate me. <laughs> so it's like, you, like you just come together with anyone that has walked past you. Oh, you shook hands with that guy. You didn't know who he was. Too bad. You're you're screwed, man. Yeah, that's it. No, I think I think I was telling this to you before we filmed, but I think we we live in a McCarthyist era with regard to, especially racism, but also other other isms. Um, I mean, I, I hope historians look back on it as that, but you know, we're getting. We're getting people fired for you know for saying the N word in an anti-racist context. You know, Papa John's, for example, yeah. got, the CEO of that got fired for saying the N word, and there was no pushback on that. Yeah. The guy said it in the context of an of... anti-racist, right? He's like recalling his the racist of his youth and the heinous things they would say. Yeah, right. And it gets fired. It get, gets his name taken off the gym of his local hometown. Just gets his reputation deep sixed, and. Right, so like it, this is happening. It happened a, a month later to 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 this executive at Netflix, who's in a in a meeting about offensive words in Netflix's comedy context. So how how do you have a meeting about offensive words without saying offensive words? Right. Unless you're just going to be talking like alphabet soup <laughs> the entire <laughs> right. time. So he says this, fired. So th these are no nobody, upon reflection, thinks that these people are racists. It is completely. It, it is it, it is analogous to McCarthyism in that sense, it, and the word racism has been denuded so fully of of its of its moral valence and its moral charge at this point that you know people you know we're, we're caring less and less about actual racism too. That's a fear here. Like right? once you once you strip this word of all its all its moral charge, then you have a boy who cried wolf scenario, which ends up backfiring spectacularly. And I would argue. That that is happening. We're seeing a, a, a surge on the on the far right as well, yeah. right? So I, I think that that was also my concern. I mean, before the election, I did plenty of videos about you got to stop calling Trump Hitler, yeah. Because if he is not Hitler, and for all the reasons that people don't like him, the guy's not Hitler. Mm -hmm. And it's like you keep doing that, you won't even realize when the real bad guys come. Yeah. And the people that would be sympathetic to your views will no longer listen to you yeah. because they'll view you as the boy who cried wolf. Yeah, and Bill Maher, Bill Maher called himself out for doing this, for calling you know, Bush and Romney racists or mm -hmm. what, what, whatever it was. He, right, he, he said that Romney hated women. Yes, and, yes. Yeah, yeah. And he called himself out for being hyperbolic so that when, when Trump, came, Trump came along, who, who actually has done clearly, or has said clearly misogynist things, mm -hmm. is, is alleged to have said some things that if he did say them, are, are clearly racist. Yeah. Um, people don't care anymore because they've been so sullied. You know, they've, they've been called racist a thousand times by the pundits at MSNBC, and it's, it's been true maybe 10% of the times, but not true. Like for the, the, the funniest case of this to me was uh, when, when Trump called Omarosa a dog, right? Uh, watch you turn on NBC, MSNBC after this, or, or read the New York Times. It is just obvious to those people that this is a racist slur. He's called this black woman a dog. This is obviously racist, and if you're defending it, you're a racist too. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you just if you have an internet connection, yeah. you look at the other people Trump has directly called a dog. You find Mac Miller before he passed away, of mm -hmm. course. You find um, David Axelrod. You find. Adriana Huffington, just you, you find white person after white person that he has directly called a dog, not said they did something like a dog, because he, he likes that construction <clears throat> too. Right. But he's called a white person after white person a dog. There's no reason to believe that this was a racist incident, and yet every pundit at MSNBC is saying that it is. And a anyone who likes Trump and you know, watches Fox News, they're getting these clips exported from mm -hmm. MSNBC. Seeing themselves called as racist by called racist by implication or by association, and then seeing someone like Tucker Carlson, who you know, I have I have reservations about, but seeing someone like Tucker Carlson make perfect sense about it, just destroy th this view with with simple logic and facts, and imagine how how refreshing it is to have 
someone like Tucker doing that. And obviously, like you're, you're going to get tired of being called a racist in, when, in cases when it's so obviously not true. And there's just a lack of due diligence. There's a lack of any concern for, for facts and for logic. And that ends up having a very a, a bad effect on the other end. Because now Trump, I mean, tr there are some things Trump has said for which racism, I think, is the best explanation. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's a Klan member. I think he's a very mild kind of New York racist of his era. You mm -hmm. know, there, there are degrees of racism, in other words. But the point is, it's like, the, the reason that Trump voters, I think, for the most part, excuse him on some of the things he said is, is not because, or not for the most part, because of a random upsurge in racism that happened in 2016 but wasn't present the past eight years. You, they're like, there are counties that went for Obama twice that went for Trump. Mm -hmm. it is, it is, I think it's largely because people are absolutely sick of, of being tarred as racists untethered to the facts of the specific cases. Yeah, and man, now we've got just the match made in hell. We've got yeah. a group that calls everyone racist, a guy who you know, is happy to fight them on every bit of it and, mm -hmm. and use that as fuel to, to get his base going. And yeah. So what do you, somehow, I, I said we were gonna shift out of race and we went right yeah, back to exactly, race. Exactly, yeah. All right, we're gonna try to finish up with something else, but what do, what do you even consider yourself politically? These days, if I if I was trying to label you, I mean, I have a sense, mm. you know, you're somewhere in that classical liberal situation. But does does that even matter to you? Do you do you think of yourself a certain way? I think if you can be gender fluid, you should be able to be politically <laughs> fluid. At this point, yeah. I think uh, I well, don't. For a white woman, I, I find your political thank views you. to be. Quite I appreciate confusing. that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, no, but I think, I mean, it, it is it is strange that. So, like politics is a social construct. Political ideologies, these are fully social constructs. And it seems like we're getting more and more rigid with the degree to which we take them seriously. Um, obviously, one should take ideas seriously, but I don't see anything to be gained from anchoring myself to conservatism or liberalism or libertarianism, even though I find wisdom in, in all of these three uh, political ideologies. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I think if if I can if I can make politically fluid a meme, <laughs> that would be that would be great. I will see what I can do. All right, yeah. give me one other thing besides race. What are you doing for fun these <laughs> days, man? Uh, I'm reading a, uh, reading a lot about. I'm taking metaphysics, taking philosophy of language and mind, both of which I what find fascinating. What are you doing for fun? Reading metaphysics. <laughs> all right, all right. You got a political future in front of you, or what? Oh God, no. And people see, this often is the problem. This people is the problem, though, right? People often ask me that. No, I would never go into politics. Actually, people assume that about me, which I think is really interesting because I detest politics. I hate it so much. Um, yeah, no, I don't, I don't know. I don't know why I give that vibe off, but it's, yeah, I, I cannot see myself as a politician. You're too sane, that's the problem. It's been a pleasure, man. Likewise. All right, for more on Coleman, follow him on the Twitter, at cold. X-Man.